So we have a ton of, of uh, submissions for sequence practice today, and unfortunately, we're only going to get through a couple. Um, there's a lot to unpack here, but I did want to just give a nice little tidbit to everybody who did respond. Uh, we do this event every two weeks. Um, we are also, so we will get you on another uh, session for a sequence review. However, um, for the first five submissions, and I'll send the link at the end of the show, but the first five submissions for sequence practice from this point forward actually get a free 30 minute review of their sequence uh, with a rev up playmaker. So um, I'll give you that link at the end. Just watch for that. But uh, without further ado, let's get started on sequence practice. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> so uh, first and foremost, yeah, again, it's, uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Jeff uh, from Rev Up Sales. Um, we put this on every two weeks to kind of help people boost their response rates on cold outbound, outbound sequences. And just as I was speaking with uh, Katie a couple of weeks ago, um, I got inspired to kind of say, okay, I didn't even know it was Women in Sales Month, to be perfectly honest. Sorry, girls. Um, I didn't but, either, and I'm so embarrassed. So, But let's celebrate it now that we know. <laughs> let, let's celebrate it. Now that we know, let's celebrate it. We're doing this. And I have to say that the majority of the people that registered for this email, and clearly everybody who's here, is a woman. So that's fantastic. Heck um, yeah. <laughs> and what we do here at RevUp is help people boost their response rates. Uh, sequence practice is our way to give back and give for those who don't have a ton of money to help improve their sequences, whatever, this is your venue to do that. So um, I'm joined by uh, our wonderful panel today. Uh, for the Women in Sales uh, event, I'm going to take a step back and let Brooke and Katie actually run the show. Uh, so I'm just going to be here uh, just to make comments here and there, but they are going to be the ones that are reviewing your sequences. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Brooke, you want to give a quick 30 second intro to yourself? Sure. Yeah, there's a photo of me with hair from before. It's, I chopped it all off. <laughs> I said that. that too. I was like, wait a second. <laughs> it really trips people up at Outreach, including my teammate Moses, who was like, is that you or a different you? Um, okay, so until about me, my name is Brooke. Um, I currently work at Outreach. I lead our corporate, um, meaning mid-market, so calling into companies between 250 to 2,500 employees, SDR team, so like 95% outbound, working to book meetings for our account executives. Um, I love sales development orgs. I started my career as an SDR right out of school, worked my way up into the AE thing, and then found my way into management and have loved it. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to uh, just kind of doing regular sales management, helping my team hit the number, uh, one of my passion projects is totally increasing the diversity of sales, uh, whether that's on the gender split or uh, racial diversity, just making sure that uh, we increase that uh, in tech and then SaaS specifically. So if any of y'all ever want to talk about that, Hit me up. Awesome. Thanks, Brooke. And mm -hmm. we also have Katie from Sales Hacker. So Katie, please give a, a quick <laughs> Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Katie Ray. I'm so excited to be here with you all. Um, whenever I had heard about this, I knew Brooke was on here. I was like, oh my gosh, I have to get on here. Um, I am the community engagement manager um, over at Sales Hacker, and we are a online community designed to help B2B sellers, wherever they're at, get them the right tools, meet, you know, introduce them with the right people. Um, and I've always just had a passion for sales. I've been in sales for a little over five years now, which mm -hmm. makes me feel really old by saying that. Um, <laughs> but I have- Just wait, I, <laughs> just wait. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's, it's all relative, right? Yeah. Um, but I have done everything from IT recruitment all the way to being a territory sales rep with seven states. And so now recently moving to Sales Hacker and I love it. And I'm just so excited to be here because honestly, I always struggled with my sequences. I never felt like I was super creative. And so um, I've been able to review a lot of sequences and, and look at different things and get different opinions. So I'm really excited to hopefully provide new, new aspects for things today. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you both for joining. Uh, once again, um, I'm going to leave the uh, opinions to you too. And uh, I'm just going to be asking you questions, maybe poking and prodding you for things. <laughs> so Sounds thinking, good. It might be the pain in your side, but it also be good. <laughs> um, so with that said, let's, without further ado, let's get for, on, uh, started on our first sequence submission. Um, so this first one is for a company that makes uh, software QX, QA testing faster for technical and QA leaders. 
Um, this is an asset in the prospecting stage of the sales process. It's a four touch sales sequence um, that is 100% automated. And this is used for prospects with no phone number listed or any recent news or anything to address um, in personalized way. Uh, the challenge is that um, this uh, particular sequence is the English version of a German sequence. And it gets about a third to a quarter of the response rate of the German speaking one does. So that's, that's something that needs to be addressed. And there's also another thing is uh, this particular company has a huge product portfolio and the rep finds it difficult to understand, um, you know, which product to focus in, which product to lead with. Um, so think about that when you're running your sequences and we'll get started by, with, uh, by showing the actual sequence flow. So um, do uh, Brooke or Katie, do you have any mm -hmm. notes uh, what you see here as far as a sequence flow? What do you think is going to be the success of this um, sequence based on what you see? Um, yeah, I definitely like bumping it. We see a ton of success with that. So glad to see that you have that. Um, knowing that it's all automated, um, makes sense if like you don't have any phone numbers, but I would be curious for the person who created this, if you do have so many different product offerings, mm -hmm. um, and different, it sounds like it's mostly the same persona, but you might have a hunch on like what people are interested in. It might be worth creating since it's only four steps. Um, automated sequences for each of those products or things like an example that we do is like we have automated sequences for marketing sales ops and sales leaders so that the content in there like we know generally what sales leaders th like care about and generally what marketers care about um, so it can be tailored that way and then still keep the uh the automated aspect of it cool, cool. oh and uh before thanks brooke and one thing lila was asking what is bumping Oh gosh, sorry. <laughs> Internal <laughs> term. Um, that's when you, so your step two, re yeah. auto reply to the first email, we call that a bump because you're like nudging somebody or poking them again with just like a, Hey, any thoughts or did you see this? Um, just replying to your last email. But go ahead, Katie. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're so good. I, I didn't know what that was either. So <laughs> I was asking, I was like, I feel like that's maybe like a little nudge thing, but I'm not really yeah. sure. <laughs> Um, so I would do this a little differently, um, just depending on like what the body of your emails are. I have also had to sell products where we had a huge product line and multiples of them. And I had no idea most of the time what our products did. And so luckily I had amazing engineers. Um, but what I would do was lead in with, Hey, you know, if I'm selling into education in one little area and I've already won two customers or two other schools in that area, I would reference those um, and, and try and leverage that and say, hey, you know, we, we did, we solved this problem for A, B, and C, but they also struggled with X, Y, Z. You know, are you seeing that as well? Or what has been frustrating for you? And I think whoever you're targeting to, like you need to sell to what role they're in. And so if you're talking with an IT director who's at one school and he only has himself and like another part-time employee, you know, you, you're trying to sell different things than if you would to the superintendent. So I would say, keep that in mind whenever you're looking at this. And um, if it's a targeted list, I would also say you could probably keep it pretty custom too. So look, up, look at that a little bit. Right, right. Good, good stuff. Thank you. Um, so I'll get, I'll, I'll get you another question here. Um, Anna asks, uh, do you recommend social touches for something like this, especially if you don't have phone numbers? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think for sure LinkedIn uh, is super helpful. It kind of depends on what your bandwidth is. Like, I'm assuming that if this person has an entirely automated sequence, it's because they're doing it at a scale that's just unmanageable to include like a LinkedIn view. Um, cool. Hope. Love using LinkedIn too. Um, so yeah, like if, like if this is for my interns or somebody who's qualifying accounts and they had say 2000 prospects, like I couldn't expect them to, uh, to add LinkedIn touches in there. But what you might consider doing, um, is I know like in outreach, you can set up triggers that says if somebody views this email more than three times, then generate a call task for them or like a generic task to be like, Oh, Hey, these ones you should take the time to add on LinkedIn. Um, to kind of help you prioritize. Uh, but in general, I do think LinkedIn is awesome. It just depends on how much time you get. Right on. I want to add, and I think everybody would agree, we are always told add LinkedIn, 
but what is the number one rule? We do not spam whenever we send a connection inside. <laughs> <laughs> please, 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 if you take away one thing, <laughs> let it be that. <laughs> but I really believe in the power of building relationships through LinkedIn, and I've always been like a huge advocate for connect with connect with your prospect, see what they post, comment on it, something thoughtful, like, hey, I really appreciated this. I've seen a lot of schools struggle with ABC again. And, you know, I think this is a great solution or something like that, that ties into what they're saying. You're not selling your product. You're just slowly building that relationship with them. And then eventually you start sending them content through LinkedIn or a video message. I would highly encourage that. Um, I have talked with a lot of SDRs the past few weeks, and they have said that video messages in LinkedIn messages, specifically not in emails, but in LinkedIn messages have been extremely successful. Nice. So I would add that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so um, we've got some good uh, nuggets of information there. Thank you both. Um, we're going to take a look now at uh, these four emails and see what they look like. Uh, so first one, give you folks a second. I'm wondering if it's a typo or just like the, um, the nature of like auto translating, but it's the, my team at, is that the name of the company? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Jeff. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so I, okay. <laughs> I actually kind of like this. I think there's a few caveats. Whenever you're coming from a global company, what works in one market is never go. I don't mm -hmm. say never, but oftentimes does not work in another market. Yeah. And so depending if it's translated in English so that, you know, for learning purposes, I think I'm sure in, in Germany, this might work fine. Um, but if you are having to sell into another market, do research for that market. Because like I said, what works for, for NAR may not work for, you know, APAC or wherever else you're looking at. Um, I also, and, and this could be a little controversial, I am not a fan of the, I imagine this is a critical metric in your role. I don't like when people tell me what they think I, is important to me. I know that's a little different <laughs> in Brooke. If you have a different opinion, I'd love to hear it, but I don't like that. I'm not a fan of that. I think Why does it rub you the wrong way? I does don't it just know. Like Maybe it's like don't childhood. Know. <laughs> you don't know me. <laughs> yeah, you don't know me. <laughs> that's a good point. Like, I think you bring up a really good point that like, nobody likes to be sold at. And if you're like, assuming that you know my business like you just it hurts you so bad when you're like like yeah. if my team called into an insurance firm they start referring to their sales development reps like we don't have that we have field reps or yeah. like brokers like you have no idea what you're talking about and it just kind of makes you look silly I also I, I well and I think there's like such a gray area right because everyone nowadays is like sell on value and sell on pain and like all this stuff, but you can't really understand that unless you get into a discovery call with them. So it's kind of like the chicken before the egg, I feel like with some of this. Um, but also the, I think the only other thing I would probably do differently is instead of say, can we find a time, you know, I would say I have time or, you know, Hey, like back to education, super simple. I know you're probably in classes from, eight to, to five, you know, I'm available at 515 or something like that um, and give a few days or better yet, put a Calendly link. But I know that there's some controversy around that too. So <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm probably that. in the camp of, <laughs> I wouldn't put a link in the first email, <laughs> but maybe like in the third or fourth. Yes. Yeah. When you've liked and like, I'm trying to get in touch with you. I do want to call out. I like that. We've been talking a lot about, um, using like if anybody has read the book selling above and below the line um above the line people being executives and using away message here so like um sniff out bugs that hurt conversion rate so rather than like uh, towards messaging of like here's all the nice to haves and like here's mm -hmm. all the awesome stuff you could have but like calling out a pain um and like trying to attach some emotion to it like hurting conversion rates like bugs no good like that already creates a lot of feeling there um 
And you could say maybe instead of I imagine this is a critical metric, like drill into it harder, drill in, uh, bugs that hurt your conversion rates and their digital channels, which ultimately lead to lost revenue or something. Ooh, I like that. To, like, dig it in a bit. Is that more. like ethos? Yeah. <laughs> but appealing to their emotion. <laughs> I love that. Excellent. Um, yeah, well, there, there is, there are some things I've heard on other sales hacker webinars, actually. The, uh, uh, some people believe that um, if you don't know your prospect, then at least you have uh, knowledge, I guess, industry knowledge of your prospect. Mm -hmm. So if you're selling to doctors, you should know what other doctors care about. Katie, you mentioned the education, you know, you're busy mm -hmm. from eight to five. Just knowing that demonstrates domain knowledge and demonstrates that you're somebody that, yeah. that actually understands my world, right? Um, but I guess uh, if I'm to understand you correctly though, Katie, you, gotta, you have to really know their world and not just assume based yeah. on what you think you know. For me, what I saw a lot of success with was whenever I talked with like happy customers of ours, hey, why did you choose us? And I think as an account exec or, or even an SDR, you know, that could be a good conversation and, and to learn a little bit more about why people are, are liking your product and looking at use cases and like what problems you solved and leveraging that. Um, I think that is, is a huge aspect to, to really appeal to that consultative expert approach that we're all trying to become nowadays. Right, right, right. No, thank you. Um, okay, well, we have uh, several questions here, so I'm going to get to those. Um, I know that Anne's going to drop off soon, so uh, why don't we let Anne have a quick question. So she asks, um, so my VP of sales wants myself and my counterpart uh, to send up to 1,000 automated emails a day. What's Please. your thoughts on that? <laughs> I mean, uh, I would say... I would challenge the notion of like measuring emails as a KPI because there are, whether you're using outreach or sales lot, like anything out there can help you do that. So you're not, it's not really the person. It's like your tools are sending the emails nowadays. Um, what I would recommend doing is like, if you have a number of prospects that you're supposed to be working or like accounts that need to be active, as long as those are like above whatever your threshold is, like for my team, for them to be successful, they have to have 140 accounts plus active in sequence. And we get there by having a, you have to add people to your sequence, your pipeline, 15 a day, but I don't actually measure them on the emails just because like outreach is doing it, not them. Um, so I would just, and if you ever want to chat offline, I'd be very curious as to like where the, um, that intention comes from. Uh, and if there's another like fix to it, because that does sound like a lot. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know I said I wasn't, I wouldn't jump in, but uh, I have to say like, <laughs> When you're doing a thousand emails at a time, um, you are playing with fire when it comes to your email service providers. Uh, mm -hmm. They're looking at that as like every email of recipient that you get is going to be looking at this is a, this is spam, <laughs> you know, yeah. so you have to be very, very careful and you need to balance your threshold there. Yeah. I would say, um, I, I agree. And I've been at companies where I don't have tools like outreach or sales loft and nothing's worse than mail merging. Oh, and, I and <laughs> remember those days. <laughs> <And Good times. laughs> 900 out of the a hundred come back and your email is cramped. And so honestly, I would suggest depending on your relationship with your manager, talk with them and just say, Hey, I, I've done some research on this and here's what I found and here's the success rates of more custom approaches. You know, can you help me understand why a thousand, where'd you get to that number, what that looks like? Um, Cause I think one, that'll really show that like you're taking ownership, but then also maybe they don't know either. And they're like, oh, I mm -hmm. heard this once. And I thought it sounded like a good, idea. like it sounded reasonable, go for it. So maybe, yeah. I'll and I really think like, yeah, today's day and age activity is not indicative of like good outcomes. Yeah. Like you can be really busy, but not productive. Um, so yeah. And like knowing that typically an automated email gets like a one or 2% response rate. Like, I don't know if the juice is worth the squeeze to send out a thousand of them, <laughs> but who knows? Yeah. yeah. And, and I should add too that it's very expensive for contacts too if you're buying. Yeah, it is. <laughs> How are you going to fill a list like that? That's extreme. Yeah, yeah five thousand a week. Good lord. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Um, well, we have a uh, a bold participant who wants to ask her question live. Yes. So, Lila, uh, please, that. you have the mic. 
<laughs> awesome. I have the floor, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask a question. Hi, guys. I guess I should introduce myself. My mm -hmm. name is Lila, and I'm an enterprise SDR on at Telium. So awesome. I have been utilizing outreach, and I have so many tasks, too many, too many manual sequences, and I'm trying to automate them. And Brooke, uh, I mean, both you guys, I'm just wondering, how do you um, keep you know, I'm switching to automated, but how do I keep it personalized? Um, I can't put those, I can't put their first name in the title. So, you know, I, I usually do first name following up or first name something or first name plus Telium, but I don't want it to sound spammy around automated. So any, any tips around that? Uh, yeah, I have a couple of follow-up questions. Thank you for sharing. Sure. Um, yeah. So when you say you can't put them in the title, you mean the subject line? Subject line. Yeah. You should be able to, and if you want to stay on the Zoom later or get on another <laughs> one, I can show you how to do it in like five minutes. <laughs> yeah, that would I think we can help you there. Um, number two, you mentioned you have too many tasks. Like, what is too many? Like, eight hundred. That is a lot. Um, yeah. A lot of action. Typically, action tasks. yeah. When you are adding people, like, mm -hmm. do you have like a daily KPI, or did you add a bunch of people in bulk, or um, like, how did you get to eight hundred? It's usually bulk. Yeah, it's usually like trying to cover multiple accounts and just mass doing it. But then I'm finding more success on LinkedIn and like video, mm -hmm. you know, on other <laughs> channels. But I'm like, okay, I also need to contact people and build my pipeline over email too. So I'm trying to make it the most For sure. efficient. So um, you're not alone. I've talked to a lot of people yeah. who run into this issue of like I'm drowning in tasks. And the yeah. bulk thing, um, I would recommend moving away from bulk and here's why like we used to do that too thinking like hey like look we're being so ahead of things and yeah. like you know rep would stay on a Sunday night but like boss look at all these people I added I'm like way ahead of the curve I put 200 people in but the way however your sequence is built you're gonna have all that stuff due on the same day which you have now and now you are the bottleneck in the outreach it's like it can't fire out because it's probably waiting on you to make a call mm -hmm. or you to do a LinkedIn task yeah um which is why now we have a daily KPI of like 15, 10 of which should be custom emails. So you're effectively writing 10 emails a day that then get bumped and your other five can be automated. So you can still have that control over like, hey, I know what's getting sent out and I feel good about these. And it's a reasonable mm -hmm. amount for me to execute every day. Um, to fix your 800 overdue, uh, I would honestly recommend if you have call anything that's over like three days overdue it's like if way, even if it's like way more than that, i would just skip it or like really? okay. start it again because like this has happened when people go on vacation um they come back and they're like i have 500 call tasks to make and i'm like <laughs> yeah i think you are a phenomenal rep but it is unlikely that you will do that in a day <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just have them go through and skip them all because it's usually like an email that can fire out right after that and then like things will kind of start to mellow out. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I, I also hate how it's like they're slipping through the cracks too, because if they're not consistently followed up with- I know it hurts, you know, in a right? cadence, <laughs> it hurts, yeah. I'm like, what am I doing here? Like, why do I even bother if it's, if it's sporadic? Mm-hmm, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's what I would shift to. Okay, awesome, thanks for it. Excellent, mm -hmm. well, th thanks for asking your question, Lila. I hope it's uh, helpful for you. Uh, now we will head back into our one more email on this sequence and then we'll move on to our next one. So, um, Brooke, Katie, I want to take a second to take a look at that. Okay. I have, oh, wait, but I have a thought. <laughs> Do it, Brooke. Do the thing. Uh, I think it's too long. <laughs> like if they didn't read your first one, they're not going to read this one for sure. So I would just make it like one line of like, any thoughts? Did you get this? Uh, and then just wait. Um, Cause typically I haven't found a lot of success if it's a really long, after a long, after a long email. So I kind of wonder if, cause the first line is, seems I caught you at a bad time when I first reached out. I know I have said that, <laughs> but it's, <laughs> <laughs> but it's usually like a, like I just cold called you and it didn't work or I called and left a voicemail. I was like, Hey, just couldn't, you know, just called you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Please love me. You hung up uh, on me, but I'll pretend it was about the phone died. I, I think we got disconnected. <laughs> Sorry, it's my house. Yeah. It's weird. <laughs> um, what I would do, I totally agree. I think it is so long. I would not read this. Um, I would change, are you interested in our trial test as a POC? One, are you, like, I'd be curious, are you saying this because you've had this conversation with them before? It's step three, so, but if they're wanting to book a call because of it, I, like, I don't know. But if I did that, I would get rid of the whole next three paragraphs and say, you know, I'd love for us to get on a call to talk about a trial, like a free trial test to show you how this will solve X, Y, Z, something like that. But yeah, the other thing too about the trial, like I don't think it's bad to offer that up, but I think like what we've coached our reps to do because we found it works better is like if you have something in your back pocket and the meeting is what you want in the beginning, wait until they've said no or given you a response before you mm -hmm. offer it. Like if they reply and they're like not interested, then you can be like, well, totally understand. Just so you know, we're doing these free trial things. Does that change your mind? Because then you have something to come back with. Otherwise, it's just like give, give, give. And we haven't gotten anything from them. Interesting. Yeah. I, I think that's, I totally agree. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> really good. Well, yeah, because you, yeah, you want to always go for the no. I think that's like what people say nowadays. And so try and get that no out of the way. But yeah, use this as a leverage to get that, that actual meeting for sure. Yeah. So if you, so if you, if both of you thought there was one thing that we could do to improve this message, what would it be? Shorten it. <laughs> okay. Short I mean, sweet. literally they could say everything about the trial test in one sentence because I mean, really you want to get them on the, the goal is to get them on the call to talk about the trial and during that call. And you could even set that dirt. You know, if you're interested in a trial test, we can hop on a call to talk about what the process looks like um, for the free, you know, something like that, instead of the three more paragraphs. Perfect, perfect, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna jump off this one and go right into uh, our best practices. So we said that they're one of the number one thing that we could do to improve is to be short, so be brief. Mm -hmm. What's another uh, key takeaway from this sequence that you've seen so far? Uh, like maybe be specific, be, be specific or like be targeted. Mm -hmm. Be specific. And I think um, it's not even really related to like the content, but I think if you're using this at scale, like use the automation to your benefit and set up some kind of like, I can go view, did people view my emails? I can set up some kind of trigger, um, but like use it to help you prioritize instead of just relying on it. Cause very rarely do people like, it's not surprising to me that you're not booking meetings on this, but I bet you're getting something, an yeah. open or a click or a forward. And that's super helpful, but you can do right. something with that. Right, right, right. Perfect. Yeah. So we have be brief, be specific and targeted and leverage the automation that's available to you. Awesome. Thank you Sounds so good. much. Uh, these are great tips. <laughs> um, so now to our second submission, we're going to motor through this one. Um, so our second submission is this is from a software company that helps realtors generate leads and sell more listings. Um, so the asset, again, this is in the prospecting stage. It's a 10 touch email sequence or 10 touch multi-channel sequence that mixes email, phone, social engagement, and video. Uh, I think Katie's going to like this one. <laughs> um, and uh, the challenge is, uh, in truth, we actually don't have details on response rates, so we don't know um, how this is performing. So sorry about that. But uh, let's jump right into it and take a look at uh, the sequence flow real quick. I love all of this. <laughs> <laughs> I am such a big fan of like multi yes. touches, multiple touches. I think it's fabulous. I love it. I love it. <laughs> That makes me so happy. I love it. I would not make my first step an email. I'd make it a phone call. But, and but don't you that? think it's helpful? Oh yeah, go ahead. Why is that, Katie? <laughs> well, because I think often. Okay. Personally, 
I would make it a phone call just because then I could leverage the phone call on my email and say, hey, <laughs> seems like we got disconnected or um, <laughs> looks like I missed you, something like that. But then similarly, you can also leverage the first email and say, hey, just want to see if you got my email about X, Y, Z. And then, you know, so I guess I don't think there's anything wrong, but I would call first. I think it like depends on who you're calling into because like we have it's in the same day like within an hour of each other like you send the email and then you make a call and it's mostly so that you can read your email as your script if you took the time to personalize it and then you don't get stuck being like oh god I have something so good to say but now I'm just pitching you and it's awkward um <laughs> which I think like that's really helpful if you know that you have multiple like in the last example where like I have different products different personas like I got to keep myself together and my head on straight so I don't get lost <laughs> in this example if you if it's the same mostly every single time like you know the realtor pitch you can say it in your sleep then I think yeah you can lead with a phone call and then follow up with an email and make it a bit more custom um but I, I guess it just kind of depends on uh, what you're using it for I would also, actually, I just caught one thing. I'm not a fan of step eight. I don't think you should text people unless you have their permission to text them. Really? I, I hate getting my monthly Mary Kay text message. And I went to <laughs> one party and my little provider, sweet as a button, keeps texting me. And I'm like, this is not what I want. I feel like I'm being bombarded. And so I don't like whenever I get like a business text, unless it's for reward points, I, I would not look at it. Unless it's like my boss or someone on my team, I am not a fan. And if, if they don't have my permission, I do not, I think it's a violation. Similar to like going to their personal social media, like when you follow people on Instagram, I think that's weird. <laughs> but that's me. I think it's weird. I don't know. <laughs> uh, maybe because I saw Lila had asked a question around like how professional should you be? And it could be because I am, despite this blazer, which I put on to make myself feel smarter, <laughs> I'm extremely casual. I have Uggs on underneath these. Um, <laughs> and I work on the West Coast. So that seems like, I don't know, maybe it's just like a cultural territory thing. Um, the texting like social media anyways, like my reps have book meetings on Snapchat, which kind of horrifies me sometimes, but I'm like, all right, do what you got to do. <laughs> um, the texting piece though, I could see your point about like, that's invasive and it's also relying on you to have their mobile phone number. Yeah. Which, which not a lot of people have. have. <laughs> yeah. Like that's fantastic. But you know, maybe like half of your people you have that, or it's like their office line that gets routed, but you don't have the actual digits. Um, I do like texting for like confirmations or like if you haven't heard back, like if you've already built the rapport, but that's a really good call out. I think there's just a lot leveraged on this for like, you're assuming that you have talked to them before, you're assuming that you have their actual cell phone number and that you're not gonna piss them off. Cause I think it is like the jury is kind of split as to whether yeah. or not people like texting or not. I would also be curious um, if like the responses differ on who you're selling to. So like if I'm selling to a more tenured leader, I probably wouldn't text them. They probably would not appreciate it. But if I was selling to Brooke or Jeff, they may appreciate it. So it could be cool. I will say <laughs> there's a fabulous app called Card Snacks and I highly recommend that to anyone. And it's a fun little text app and you create customs cards for it and it's I think kind of free but that is a fabulous thing to you can text it or email and it's different and so I think if you're going to do the text approach you do something cool with it so you know yeah. um I, again I, I have to chime in sorry um but uh I actually worked for a global telecom that focused on texting for about two years or so oh. and to your point Katie in North America what we found was that texting was very invasive and very mm -hmm. difficult to uh, do effectively. So it had to be mm -hmm. a warm touch, right? But in different markets around the world, Africa, you know, Asia, different areas, texting was like an email. It was, it was not thought of in the True. Street. So depending on where your market is, um, texting can have a very different um, mm -hmm. response from your people, from your prospects. Um, so just keep that in mind who you sell to and where you sell that the channels that we're talking about can vary uh, in effectiveness, depending on where you go. Totally. 
Uh, uh, but yeah, like the LinkedIn video messaging after you've connected, um, those are really effective for us. Our UK team uh, has booked a ton of meetings doing that. So we've been trying to do the same thing internally or here in the US domestically. And uh, we get a lot of responses, not as many meetings as the EMEA team has, but still like people respond to them. It's still a pattern interrupt. And I think it'll be shiny for a couple of months and I'm sure we'll have to find something new come like a couple quarters from now, but it works right now. So do that. <laughs> Excellent. Um, no, that this sounds fantastic. So um, if uh, for, for this, again, I'm going to go back to the one thing. What if, if you folks had to vote, what would be the one thing that you would change on, on this sequence flow? I have a feeling Katie's is the text and I'm kind of like on board with that too, because it's just like, you're really it's expecting great. that you're going to have it. It's a Maybe you change to a voicemail. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, because I like, the thing is, I like everything else. I think step one and two could go either way and that doesn't bother me. Um, but you could do like a Sendoso or like an email yeah. type coffee gift card for five bucks obviously now we're attaching a dollar amount to it but talk with marketing they've got money <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> excellent well uh I, I hope maria doesn't mind but uh so maria's mentioning um so this is actually her sequence she said they sell mostly to b2c real estate agents so they actually get a lot of replies oh. to the um, so again, about knowing your audience, it seems yeah. like she Very knows your good audience. point. Yeah. <laughs> so excellent. All right, then maybe you keep it. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Maria. Never mind. We changed our answer. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Uh, oh, she agrees. <laughs> so um, excellent. Well, let's take a look at some of the messages. Um, so first message in her sequence, step one, day one. Just a little little fun tidbit of knowledge here. Realtors is actually supposed to be capitalized because if you're a realtor and you're a part of the Realtor Association, you can use it capitalized instead of lowercase, which means like general realtors. Yeah, Maria, That's I've got enough. you. I've got you. <laughs> uh, this is like a nitpicky thing because I learned how to write emails with the Hoffman approach of the why you, why you now. And they are really big on like the formatting of just leaving your one ask at the bottom. Cause like, Ooh. and you know, like just the one line. Cause like when people read emails on your phone, you're like, okay, I see my name. That's me. So I read that I'm skipping the body cause I don't care yet. What do you <laughs> want? So I go to the bottom. Then I go back to the middle, uh, which I think you have a decent middle part here of like, asking because here's the issue that other people in your space are finding and then they go back to the ask and if you what have two called? lines some hoffman like why you why you now hmm. i'm writing this down <laughs> i've never heard of that that's so smart though because i have fallen privy or pray or whatever to um doing the same thing <laughs> so that's interesting to know i didn't know it was a thing yeah um, it, it just keeps it simpler for them. And like when execs read my email, I know that they're just being like, what do you want from me? <laughs> and so I try and be really brief. <laughs> so I actually, I really love the first sentence. I actually really like it because it doesn't make me say it's not yes or no. Right. So that's mm -hmm. awesome, great. But how am I winning new listings? Well, <laughs> I'm not, or well, I'm going to marketing events, but it's not, I'm not getting as much. And I think that's the cool thing in real estate is realtors are always looking for business and they mm -hmm. always want listings. It's so much easier to be a listing agent instead of a, uh, a buying agent. And so, um, I think it's really, really cool that you're asking such a good question. And I think it, you could even play to their emotions in some aspect whenever you get them on the phone. Like what happens if you don't sell 10 houses this year? Like what can you mm -hmm. do with that? Um, which is a little gutsier of approach, but I, I really like it. Me too. And I like that you, um, like you call out what their objection is going to be like, no, I'm fine. I don't need your help by saying like, look, I get that you're already really good with referrals and you have an awesome sphere of in influence, but like what else besides that? And it kind of makes me have like FOMO of like, I don't know, is that, are other people doing yeah. other stuff? Should I be thinking about that? <laughs> 
And well, and I really like too how you're not attacking other products because you could be like, a lot of people are wasting money with Zillow trying to buy zip codes and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Instead, you're keeping the focus on you and what you do because I think a lot of times, mm -hmm. even whenever we get on cold calls, we'll say, oh, well, so-and-so does this. And they, you know, they really, their customers are really upset about that. Well, why, you know, why are you talking about their product? Talk about what you sell and what you're doing to help solve this problem. So I really like that. Excellent. Thank you. So some great uh, piece of information there. It looks like Maria's really happy with what uh, she's hearing from you. So um, we're going to do one more uh, script on here. And this is actually going to be her cold call script. So funny enough, this is actually what she does exactly immediately after she does the email. So on day one. Okay. I like that you're like following up from your email. Um, yep. The only thing, I mean, I realize this is a very small snippet of what I imagine could be a longer script. Um, I would encourage you to look at some kind of like upfront contract of like, I know you have like, would you be opposed to learning how, which is like, you're asking for permission. Um, but like the, how long are you going to pepper them with questions? They're like, Hey, can I have like two minutes of your time? Like we say 27 seconds because it's gimmicky and people listen and they're like, what are you talking about? Um, <laughs> but, uh, something around that so that they know. Cause I think usually when people avoid you on the phone, it's like when you go to retail stores and somebody says you need any help and your immediate reaction is like, Nope, stay away. I'm good. I don't need any. But if they're like, Oh, like I have this sale and I noticed that you were wearing this jacket. We have one that looks just like that. You want to go look at it? And they'll be like, Oh, okay. Maybe. Um, but just warming them up a little bit and letting them know what they're getting into. I am also a fan of the upfront contract. Um, I've seen a lot of people, um, talk about that. I think, my biggest thing is I think if you're going to say, can I get two minutes of your time? Make sure it's two minutes of your time. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't trick them because you're going to feel like you're winning because you're continuing to talk, but, but you're not, cause you're not going to get a deal. <laughs> I would also start off with here's why I'm calling and here's what I want. Instead of that, I would say, Hey, so-and-so my name is Katie. I'm from here and this is what we do. And then say, you know, would you be in, you know, opposed to learning more about how this can give you more leads or whatever that looks like. Excellent. Good stuff. Um, so uh, with that said, based on what both of you has said for this one, I have these two uh, best practices or two, two takeaways. Um, so the first one is be careful with text. So know your audience um and uh, ask permission to continue so in your cold calls is would there would you say there's any other key takeaway that maria can take to make this sequence better hmm i really like the the whole sequence itself <laughs> so i actually really like it i really like how she's putting videos in there and connecting mm -hmm. different platforms and I think if you're looking at realtors, you definitely could actually approach them through like personal social, like their Facebook realtor pages. If you have a business page, I would not do that through your personal. <laughs> um, that's me. I wouldn't do it, but um, realtors are used to getting approached that way. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's interesting. I think it was really good. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Um was my thought around this uh oh he's storytelling yeah so if you have examples of like um specific people and you don't have to say their full name like i talked to katie ray being like oh yeah so i'm this guy and katie she was using your platform to do this and she actually saw whatever your roi is um i think that can help you on the phone a lot make it sound like you know keep people's bs meter from going off and like okay <laughs> like there's real people who use this <laughs> Right, yeah. right, right. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Well, um, so we have be careful with text. We have ask, for, ask permission to continue and we have use storytelling to build value. Uh, I should actually put to get rid of their BS meter, but. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if that was appropriate for a live stream. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so I know we're, we're just over time, but we have a little bit of a bonus review uh, session that we were planning on doing for today. Uh, does anybody have any interest in looking at a job description on live on LinkedIn to see if it is female friendly? Yeah, of course. Of course. This sounds so okay. fun. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, good. Well, before we do that, I'm just going to invite everybody at home uh, in the audience watching at home um, to please, uh, if you want to get your sequence re reviewed live on the air, go to revup90.com submissions uh, to s send in your work. And for, and I'm just offering this little tidbit, as I was saying earlier on in the conversation, uh, the first five people that actually submit from this point forward, uh, we'll get actually a free half hour playmaking session with a RevUp playmaker to discuss their sequences. So um, that's the link right there, RevUp90.com slash submissions. Uh, so now let's look at, um, Katie, you sent me these four. Which one do you want to review? What, whichever one you want. Whichever one we want. Okay. Let's look at. So I definitely, I just want to put a little caveat. I definitely thought that there would be a lot more on there because of like companies that I follow, I just expected there to be more. Yeah. So I was, I was actually quite surprised when that wasn't the case. Well, let's, let's look at this. Uh, so let's look at this real quick. And so Zscaler, uh, they have a sales development rep in Dallas, Texas. Now, um, as women in sales, do you see anything on here that kind of um, catches your eye in, in the not so nice way. Let's see. Is there any chance you can make it a little bigger? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, perfect. Oh, no. <laughs> there we go. Let's see. So if you, do you mind scrolling down to the yeah. uh, like requirements? Yeah. Sorry to have you driving like that. No worries. Responsibilities. I should take a look at ours. This just seems like long to me. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm yeah. sure that there's a lot like that goes into this role. Um, but just like if there's too much on there, typically women won't apply until they can check all of it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Or like folks who don't have experience and like, like, oh, I would have, but like, it looks too hardcore. Like, I don't think they'll even look at yeah. my application. Right. Can you scroll down more? Yeah. Okay. Cause this is so I normally, when I look at job recs, I don't look at any of the body. Because mm -hmm. I feel like many SDR roles are pretty similar. Instead, I look at desired skills and experience, education, and then what, what I can expect from them. Um, I don't like highly motivated self-starter with competitive personality and strong attention to detail. I know plenty of sales reps who do not have strong attention to detail, are not competitive, and they are rock stars. <laughs> <laughs> they they do it for a totally different reason and that's fine but I think if you for for me if I wasn't as competitive as I am I'd be like oh well I'm not like what is competitive right like I'm not gonna go mm -hmm. around and backstab people to get the job I you know I don't know if that's my place uh, work in a fast-paced goal-oriented high growth sales environment like that just scares me how so because if I think about all the women that I know in my life, there is a large majority that they don't want to work in a fast pace. They just, they, for them, they want more of security. They want to do sales. They want to do a good job. They're not looking for high growth. They don't want to be like shuffled through things. Um, so I, I feel like you could, you could rephrase that differently to, to, to do a little, a little different responses on it. I could see that. Like, um, like some people might just envision like fast paced means like Wolf of Wall Street style, like running around mm -hmm. all the time and like smile <laughs> and dial. Um, but it, what it really is, is like, it's a high growth environment and like a development focused place. Yeah. Where, and I think they put that above of like, we're focused on our people. 
and helping them get promoted. Um, so yeah, I, I buy that. And then maybe like adding the, the team player thing is first. And then I think you can still put like self starter. Yeah. Um, and even motivated. Um, but you can see that they put fast paced in a few areas of it. So it's mm -hmm. like, Hmm, how, how fast are they going? Like, <laughs> yeah, you could just do like, um, like, cause re really what you're looking for, like we call it the figure it out factor. Like, do you like to learn? Um, yeah. and like, if you're placed in like, we have a lot of structure, but like, it, let's be real. It's a startup. So there's a lot of ambiguity. <laughs> like, um, are you somebody who like enjoys that and would raise their hand and be like, Hey, like this doesn't make sense to me or, um, I need some extra help here. So, um, yeah, maybe like a quick learner or, uh, yeah. willing like to learn something like that. I also, uh, so I actually have a journalism degree. And so whenever I was looking for my first job and went into IT recruitment, I was very fortunate that they weren't looking for business people, but I had actually had a horrible experience for um, a software company once where I went to an interview, found out the interviewer, um, found him on LinkedIn. He went to the same school as I did. And I thought, oh, this is going to be great. Like we have this great bond already from our schools. This is going to be wonderful. And he kind of took me through the interview a little bit and then said, well, you know, I have friends that went through that program and I know it wasn't too hard. I saw what they did. I just oh don't And I was like, that's not how this is supposed to work. Like a treat. <laughs> this oh, is not right. what's supposed to happen. And so, and now with a lot of business schools putting like professional selling programs out there, I think for me, I'd be like, well, I don't have a business or related journalism is not related. Mm -hmm but I sure as heck can talk on a phone. So maybe I'll still apply, but <laughs> I think that, you know, it makes me wonder like why they want that, especially whenever so many people in sales don't have degrees and they're still mm -hmm. very successful. Yeah, that, that would be, I mean, I would double tap on that. If like, we don't require a college degree. Uh, I imagine this is maybe an old job description that they've copy pasted through the years Yeah, um, and made edits to. I don't think it's necessary. Um, also, the one to three years, it's a nice to have, but I kind of expect that everybody comes in like no idea what a cold call is. Um, so unless it's like truly, truly required, like it's an enterprise role and you know that somebody's going to drown if they don't at least have a base, I would just take it out. Yeah. Um, so this, this, uh, well, this is a great conversation to have actually. So let, let's just end off by asking you, Brooke, you've, you've hired a lot of people on your team and <laughs> you know, you've seen with your organization, I mean, you've run through what really is successful as a BDR and, or SDR and what isn't. So what would you say are the things that, um, people should be putting in their job descriptions? Like if there were like, let's say five things that you need to have in there for a rep to be successful, what would that be? And regardless of gender, race, like sure. nationality. Um, if your company has core values and they are important to you, I would put those. Cause I think regardless of the position that you apply to, like that's going to be important to the culture fit of like, do they align with our values? Not do they pass the beer tests, which I think is irrelevant. Um, for an SDR, I mean, we're looking for a quick learner, um, collaborative, uh, like enjoys working in a team environment, um, like wants to work somewhere that's like really metric based. Um, not everybody likes having a quota. Other people are like, I know exactly if I did a good job or not because it's there on the dashboard. And like, that makes me really happy. <laughs> um, yeah. And like knowing how that motivates people. So I guess, yeah, three would be um, organized. I do think that is important. Even if it's like, you know, you have a notebook with scribbles on it, you have something to keep track of stuff uh collaborative <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> uh yeah and i guess self-starter or like enjoys learning however you want to put that but i think everything else you know you can really teach right on i don't know what would you add to that katie oh well i haven't had to hire anyone yet but i think <laughs> um desire well okay that's kind of contradictory <laughs> but like desire for growth if that's important mm -hmm. to you um, as, as a manager, if you're looking for people who are wanting to, to go that route, um, I, I would definitely add that I a hundred percent agree with the value of having values on there. Um, I just wouldn't put them on there if your company doesn't actually exhibit them, um, mm -hmm. because a lot of people have values allegedly, 
but that's not what's really shown there. And so maybe like a, what you can expect or exactly like what your day-to-day -day would look like, I think would be a better idea. And honestly, I would love to have an actual rep write the rec or at least kind of that's a good idea of mm -hmm. it to HR to, to, you know, to zhuzh it up. But then that was <laughs> actually seeing like from a rep's perspective, this is what your day-to-day -day would look like. And you would have a really good idea of what you're signing up for. Awesome. I like that. Um, there was one thing that we discussed with another uh, outreach alum, uh, Andrew. He mentioned that creativity was actually really important to rep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, do you, how would you folks rate that? Oh, yeah. I totally agree. Like, you know, you, of course there is structure and like there's a script, but there's a lot of it that's kind of on the fly. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity, especially at startups, um, autonomy to be like, hey, like I want to try this thing out and see if it works. Um, and if you enjoy that, I, I don't think it's like a total requirement, but it definitely helps. Um, and I also think that everybody has some sense of creativity, even when people are like, oh, I don't know, I'm not creative. Like I'm not like a, that's not my bag. I bet you are. You just uh, need to be put in the right role. Right, right, right. Inside the box. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, uh, thank you so much, both of you, for joining today. Uh, we did a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, hopefully, we gave a lot of really good tidbits of information. Um, but uh, anything you want to tell the crowd before we get going? Um, just thank you guys for having us or thank you all for having it, me and I'm so excited to have been able to go through this with y'all and add me on LinkedIn and if you have any questions don't forget to you know don't hesitate to reach out and join saleshacker.com for our fabulous community so <laughs> yes you know, thank you so much for having us <laughs> Thanks, Brooke. Thanks, Katie. And thanks to everybody who joined and asked questions and submitted their uh, sequences. It's been a pleasure. Uh, tune in next week or next month, actually. We're going to take a, a few weeks off. Uh, our next one is going to be November 18th, where we have Christina Finseth joining us. So um, take a look and uh, yeah, hope to have you there. Awesome. Bye. Thank you. See ya.